was still dark in the Austrian capital, and he was awoken by the phone, ringing next to his bed. He didn't mind being woken up. He wasn't really sleeping anyway. In fact, he hadn't slept a full night in weeks. And after the stunt he had pulled last night, he knew there would be consequences. He was just glad he'd finally find out what they are. He fumbled for his glasses and a pencil on his bedside table so that he could write something down if he needed to. The man in bed, awoken by the ringing telephone, was the leader of Austria, Chancellor Kurt von Schuschnigg. Schuschnigg was about the last person you'd expect to be the head of a government. Before becoming Chancellor, he was the Minister of Education, an academic, a devoted Catholic. He had been thrusted into the position of Chancellor by circumstance. Now, he was doing his best to keep Austria in one piece, which was in that month of March 1938, on the very brink of collapse. Much had happened in the four years since the Night of Long Knives, when the Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg began to hear the rumors coming out of Germany of Hitler's brutal consolidation of power. Since then, Austria's neighbor to the north had begun openly defying the Treaty of Versailles, the agreement that had put an end to the war. Germany had started building up a military again, first in secret, then out in the open. Then, Hitler shocked the Western world when he ordered the reoccupation of the Rhineland region on the German border with France. Through all of this, the countries sworn to check German aggression had done nothing but make disapproving statements, public condemnations, and vague threats. And now, because of Hitler, Chancellor Schuschnigg had just gone through the most trying and terrifying four weeks of his life and it was about to get much worse. He turned on the light and picked up the phone. It was the chief of federal police. Herr Chancellor, I have urgent news. The Germans have closed the border at Salzburg. Rail traffic between the two countries has been halted, and German troops are concentrating on the Austrian frontier. Schuschnigg dropped the receiver. It was happening. The invasion was about to begin. I'm Michael Trapani, and this is How to Start a War, a story from the past that can help us understand our world today. While the characters we follow are at the center of this story, they are not the heroes. This is not that kind of story. This story is about what happens when good people do nothing to stop the worst people on Earth while they still can. Let's continue. Chapter 4. Fear. This has been true for every chapter in this story up until now, but sometimes I need to remind even myself that the events that take place in the episode you're about to hear actually happened. Think about that for a moment. The words that will be said, the actions that will be taken, all of them are from a historical record. Most of them primary resources. People who were in the room or spoke the words. The people in this story all seemed to understand the historical weight of this moment and wrote down their conversations, often the same day they took place. In some cases, the conversations were actually transcribed in real time because they took place over the phone or in an official proceeding. The dialogue you will hear come from these records. Process that. Then rejoin our story. We're on a train in the Austrian Alps. 
It's nighttime, and we're approaching Salzburg near the German border. Yes, that same Salzburg that the frantic call was about, but that phone call wouldn't happen for another four weeks from tonight. Now, in February, it's a crisp and quiet night in the mountains. As you look around inside the train car, you realize that this is no ordinary train, but a private one, a secret one. It's a government train, and it's carrying precious cargo. The leader of Austria himself, Kurt von Schuschnigg. A tall, thin, academic of a leader. He was reading a book under the low light on his eighth cigarette. When the train stopped near the border, he and his aide were escorted into the car that was waiting for them by a German diplomat. The car would take them over the border into Germany. Schuschnigg had an appointment in the morning that he could not afford to miss. His appointment was in Obersalzburg with his counterpart, the Reich Chancellor and Führer of Germany, Adolf Hitler. While everything we've recounted in previous chapters was happening in Germany, the rise of the Nazi party, the consolidation of Hitler's power, some of that carnage was spilling over into the neighboring Austria. And Schuschnigg had begun to worry that the wave of extremism would absorb his own country, from the inside or from out. Austria had a complicated relationship with Germany in recent years, from German-backed pro-Nazi factions raising hell across Austria to Nazi sympathizers in the Austrian government itself. It appeared as if Hitler was making subversive attempts to destabilize the Austrian government, and everybody knew that Hitler wanted to annex Austria by any means necessary. Remember, Hitler wasn't German, he was Austrian. And he, like many German nationalists at the time, was obsessed with the idea of unification of Germany and Austria, two countries that shared a culture, a language, and most recently fought together on the same side of a great war. The Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg wasn't stupid. He knew what Hitler was doing. And in response, Schuschnigg's Austrian government began cracking down on Nazi demonstrations, arresting Nazi activists in Austria, even banning the party completely. Things were getting out of hand, and to settle the matter, the two heads of government agreed to a secret meeting at Hitler's personal residence in the German Alps. The Berghof. As the sun was rising, Schuschnigg's car crawled up the hill, and he could begin to make out the villa at the very top. The Berghof, Hitler's mountain estate. The Berghof, more than anywhere else in Germany, was Hitler's home. The small mountain town that the estate was built in quickly transformed into Hitler's compound. The SS had converted the village buildings into barracks, forts, and defense outposts. The Berghof mansion was built above ground to be a state house, one that foreign dignitaries could visit, dine, and negotiate. There were libraries and ballrooms and terraces and massive windows giving visitors a grand view of the Alpine mountain range. Below ground was Hitler's residence, an underground fortress beneath the hard bedrock of the mountains so that he would be protected in case it was ever bombed. In the morning, the sun was casting bright rays onto the snow, making the day feel clear. As Schuschnigg's car pulled into the long driveway, the Austrian Chancellor's eyes were drawn to the grand steps of the villa. As he lit another cigarette in the car, he could see that he wasn't being greeted by one man, but by a group of men. In the center was Hitler, his hands at his side with a smile on his face. That wasn't surprising. What was surprising were the others who were with him. Schuschnigg wasn't expecting any other guests, and the German diplomat that was with him in the car, escorting him to the villa, could tell that Schuschnigg was annoyed. The German diplomat said that Hitler was in a wonderful mood this morning, and that he had hoped Chancellor Schuschnigg didn't mind that he would be joined by three of Hitler's generals, who had just made a surprise visit to the Fuhrer last night. Schuschnigg didn't buy this for a second, but said in a frustrated tone that it was acceptable, and it wasn't as if he had any other choice. 
The German diplomat then asked Schuschnigg if he wouldn't mind putting out his cigarette, and made it clear that there was no smoking allowed in Hitler's presence. Schuschnigg let out a sigh and took one more long pull. He put out the cigarette and felt a pang of anxiety. He wasn't sure when he'd be able to smoke again. The car stopped, and he stepped out. He was greeted first by Hitler. Then he introduced his three generals, who had just stopped by. The first was the most senior, General Keitel, a man who was the highest operational military officer in Germany, the head of the German High Command. He was basically the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the guy who was in charge of the day-to-day -day of every branch of the German military. The second man was the commander of the Air Force in southern Germany, and the third was the commander of the armed forces on the German-Austrian border. Three generals, all of whom had one thing in common. If any action were taken against Austria, these men would be the ones to carry it out. Of course, the generals didn't stop by. Hitler brought them there to send a very clear message to the Austrian Chancellor. Schuschnigg also knew what message was being sent, but he was polite in his greeting, as he always was. And after the introductions, the two leaders were led away from the group, up to the second floor, into the study. This room might have been built for this exact meeting. Upon entering the study, your eyes are immediately drawn to the window directly in front of you. Well, it's hard to call it just a window. It was actually, and this is not an exaggeration, but an actual fact, the largest window on Earth at the time. It was more like a wall of glass that gave guests a sweeping vista of the Alps, the snow-capped mountains, and most notably, Austria. Schuschnigg couldn't help but be impressed with the room, and as was typical in Austrian negotiations, he began with pleasantries. He commented about the beauty of the room, the beautiful day. He even tried to flatter Hitler by pondering how many important conversations must have taken place in this very room. But Hitler cut him off, and by doing so, set the tone for the rest of the day. We did not come here to speak of the fine view or the weather. You are here because you have done everything to avoid a friendly policy. The whole history of Austria is one uninterrupted act of high treason, both in the past and today. This historical paradox must now reach its long overdue end. And I can tell you right now, Herr Schuschnigg, that I am absolutely determined to make an end to all of this. The German Reich is now one of the great powers, and nobody will raise his voice if it settles its border problems. Schuschnigg was shocked by the abrupt accusation by Hitler, but he remained polite in his response, deciding to engage in the debate instead. I differ from my host's view of Austria and German history he said. Austria's contribution to German history is considerable. Absolutely not, Hitler shot back. I'm telling you, absolutely not. Every German idea was sabotaged by Austria throughout history. Schuschnigg needed to calm the mood, so he tried to steer the conversation back to a friendlier tone and to appeal to the two countries' similarities. Herr Reich Chancellor, Austrian contributions cannot be separated from German culture, Take, for instance, a man like Beethoven. Schuschnigg probably didn't know what he had just said. Hitler loved Beethoven and snapped back. Oh, Beethoven! Well, let me tell you that Beethoven came from the Rhineland. And yet Austria was his country of choice, as it was to so many others. Be that as it may, Hitler changed the subject. I am telling you, from now on, things cannot go on this way. I have a historic mission, and this mission I will accomplish, because providence has destined me to do so. Those who are not with me will be crushed. I have chosen the most difficult road that any German has ever taken, and I have made the greatest achievement in German history, greater than any German. And not by force, mind you, I was carried along by the love of my people. Schuschnigg smiled. Herr Reich Chancellor, I am quite willing to believe that. For almost an hour, the two men continued their debate on German culture and the relationships of their two countries, until finally Hitler came to the point of today's meeting and dropped a bomb. I am telling you that I am going to solve this so-called Austrian problem one way or another. 
Hitler then faced Schuschnigg directly. You really don't think you can move a single stone in Austria without me hearing about it the next day, do you? All I have to do is give a single order, and in one night, all of your ridiculous defenses will be blown to bits. You don't seriously believe that you can stop me for even a half an hour, do you? I would very much like to save Austria from such a fate, because such an action would mean blood. After the army, my SA would move in, and when that happens, nobody would be able to stop their just revenge. Not even I. Schuschnigg's stomach began to sink. Hitler had just threatened Schuschnigg with an invasion of Austria. Why? Because he could. Because it would be easy. Hitler went on to describe just how alone Austria was. And don't think for one moment that anybody on earth is going to thwart my decisions. Italy? I see eye to eye with Mussolini. England? England will not move a single finger for Austria. And France? France could have stopped Germany and the Rhineland. Now it is too late. I give you once more, and for the last time, the opportunity to come to terms, Herr Schuschnigg. Either we find a solution now, or events will take their course. Think it over, Herr Schuschnigg. Think it over well. I can only wait until this afternoon. Sitting still in his chair, Schuschnigg had kept a straight face as he listened to Hitler's rant. Now coming to realize that Hitler was threatening to end Austria, and he knew there would be nothing he could do about it. He responded calmly. And what are the Chancellor's terms? This question seemed to snap Hitler out of his anger. He stood up and said, We can discuss that this afternoon. First, lunch. Lunch was a conversation between Hitler and himself. He was in a good mood, almost as if the furious rant he had just lambasted the Austrian Chancellor with a few minutes ago had never happened. He spoke loudly and cheerfully, talking openly about his ambitions for Germany. But Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg wasn't listening. Hitler could have been talking about anything. His mind was racing after the conversation he had just had with the German leader. His jaw was tightening, he hadn't had a cigarette in hours, and his foot was beginning to tap on the floor. He had a headache, he couldn't think straight. Days ago, when the two leaders agreed to meet, Hitler had promised to keep this meeting about settling differences. Instead, Hitler had just threatened a full-scale invasion by Germany into Austria. This was now the predicate of negotiations. Hitler had changed the rules, and he was ready to declare war. Schuschnigg knew that Hitler's boasting of German military superiority was also true. Austria would not survive such a conflict. His best hope now was to try to curb the demands of the German leader and leave this meeting in one piece. And after the rumors that came out of Germany about the Night of Long Knives, coming out in one piece was not a guarantee. After the two men finished their coffee, Hitler excused himself for a few hours, saying that he had state matters to attend to. He got up and left the room. Schuschnigg let out a big exhale, now alone for the first time since the morning. He stepped outside, reached into his inside coat pocket, and lit a cigarette. His aide appeared as well and joined him. Shishnik was relieved to see a familiar face. The Chancellor quickly briefed his aide on everything that had just happened. The meeting with Hitler, the threat of invasion, and what they should do about it. After two hours of discussing their options with each other, the two Austrians were led into a room with Germany's new foreign minister, the wily Joachim von Ribbentrop. He was standing in front of a table with a single typed sheet of paper. As the men walked into the room, the German foreign minister slid the document across the table towards them. The German foreign minister spoke in a stern tone. These are Hitler's final demands. They are not up for discussion, and they must be signed now. Schuschnigg's eyes slowly fell onto the words of the document. And as he read it, the color left his face. These were the terms that Hitler demanded from Austria on that bright and cold February afternoon in the German Alps. 1. Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg was to turn over the Austrian government to the Nazi party within one week, ending political autonomy for Austria. 2. The ban on the Nazi party in Austria was to be lifted. 
Three, all Nazi prisoners were to be released. Four, the Austrian army was to become absorbed into the German army, giving Hitler control of the Austrian military. Five, preparations were to be made for Austria to be assimilated into the German economic system. Shushnik's stomach sank with each line that he read. These were not terms of negotiation. They were terms of surrender, a conquest. Austria would be effectively annexed into Germany. With this document, Germany would become an empire, and Austria would be its first vassal. The Austrian Chancellor put the document down and looked up angrily at Foreign Minister Ribbentrop. I must protest, Herr Minister. I made a formal agreement with your government before coming to this meeting that the question of Austrian sovereignty would not be discussed today. I am not prepared to be confronted with such demands. But then Schuschnigg stopped himself and thought about what standing up to Hitler would actually mean, not only for him, but for his people. A war with Germany would end in an Austrian defeat. There was no doubt about that. Germany's military buildup over the last year had already made it a regional threat, and Austria had no strong defenses against a German attack. Domestic issues were no better. The unrest, the Nazi activism fueled by Hitler's foreign interference was working, and a war with Germany would not be universally accepted by the Austrian public. A bloodbath of a war, unsupported by a united front, that would end in an Austrian defeat. Along with hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Austrians and Germans dead. Chancellor Schuschnigg began to break. He looked back up angrily at Foreign Minister Ribbentrop and asked, If I were to agree to such terms, will the German government operate in good faith and hold up their end to the bargain? The scheming Ribbentrop made a crooked grin, responding simply, Yes. Ribbentrop then took the two Austrians back into Hitler's study. As the large doors opened, the Austrian men saw the German leader pacing back and forth behind his desk. Hitler's hands were clasped behind his back, and his head cocked up, looking towards the men as they walked in. His voice sliced through the room, high-pitched, as if he was coming to the climax of a speech. Herr Schuschnigg, you have the draft of the document. There is nothing to be discussed. I will not change a single iota. You will either sign it as is and fulfill my demands within three days, or I will order the march into Austria. Chancellor Schuschnigg's response was broken and timid in the face of what might be the end of his country. He played the last card he had, an appeal to formality. Herr Hitler, I am willing to sign, but I must remind you that under the Austrian constitution, only the president has the power for such an agreement and carry it out. Therefore, while I am willing to accept these terms and appeal to the president to do the same, I cannot give a guarantee. Hitler stopped, turned on his heels, fully facing the Austrian chancellor. Well, you have to guarantee it. I could not possibly have Chancellor- General I Keitel! Hitler barked, losing it. He turned towards the window and looked out onto the terrace where his generals were sitting. He pushed open the window and bellowed out, General Keitel, come here at once! He then turned back to Schuschnigg and seared, I shall have you called in later! The Austrian leader was then ushered out of the room with the door closed behind him. General Keitel, when hearing his name, sprung to his feet and briskly entered the room to join Hitler. He walked up to the Fuhrer and saluted, asking, What are my orders? Hitler was smiling. There are no orders. Hitler began to chuckle. I just wanted you here. Outside of the study, Schuschnigg's hands were shaking as he lit a cigarette. He didn't care who saw it anymore. He looked to his aide and said, I'll be surprised if we are not arrested in the next five minutes. After waiting for 30 nervous minutes outside of the study, the men were led into the room once again. This time, Hitler was flanked by his generals. Schuschnigg! Hitler shouted from across the room at the Austrian Chancellor. I have decided for the first time in my life to change my mind. But I warn you, this is your very last chance. I will give you an additional three days to carry out our agreement. Three more days. 
three more days added to the lifespan of Austria. Schuschnigg, who needed to get out of there alive, finally broke and signed the agreement. It would be Austria's death warrant. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Michael. Thank you for listening to How to Start a War. If the story so far has been meaningful to you, please share it with someone else. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and write us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. And thanks again. Now, back to the story. The next four weeks would be one of the most decisive moments in the history of Austria. It would be named by Chancellor Schuschnigg the Four Weeks Agony. You're about to find out why. When Chancellor Schuschnigg returned to Austria, he knew he was on a tight timeline with high stakes. In their meeting in the Alps, Hitler had given Schuschnigg a total of seven days to carry out the terms, or Germany would invade. The terms were to turn over Austrian government to the Nazi party, end the ban on Nazis, release the Nazi prisoners, align their armies, and enter the German economy. In seven days. His first stop was to see the president of Austria, President Miklas. Austria had a similar government system to what used to be in Germany. It was a chancellor, Schuschnigg, who was the head of the government, and then a more of a figurehead president, Miklas, who was the head of state. Most large government decisions, like, say, turning over the government, required both of them to sign off. So Schuschnigg was right when he said he couldn't legally agree to Hitler's terms by himself. He needed the Austrian president to agree, too. In Vienna, Schuschnigg went to President Miklas's office and appealed to the president to agree to the terms. Otherwise, they would risk a German invasion. President Miklas was not at the meeting with Hitler. He was not threatened with invasion by the German dictator in person. The president was not a particularly brilliant statesman, but he did have a reputation of loving his country, loving his many children, and was known to be very brave. His reaction to Schuschnigg's appeal to give in to Hitler's demands was a hearty no. President Miklas was okay with a few concessions, like releasing some of the Nazi prisoners, but he would not allow a turnover of the government to a banned political party, and he certainly did not approve of putting Austrian Nazis that were hand-picked by Hitler in charge of Austria. But back in Germany, Hitler expected there would be resistance from President Miklas, and so he ordered the German military to begin a deployment, a simulation, as if they were preparing for military action. To be clear, at this moment, Hitler had no intention of actually invading Austria at all. Invasions on that scale take months to plan. Instead, he ordered his military to fake it, as if they were about to. The ever-loyal minister of propaganda, Josef Goebbels, writes of it in his diary. General Keitel tells us that the Fuhrer's orders are to apply pressure by shamming military action, should be kept up until February 15th. And so, the sham invasion preparation was carried out. All along the border, the German military conducted exercises, pulled into formations, and spread false rumors that military action was taking place. It was enough to scare President Miklas into believing that Hitler's threat of invasion was real. He conceded to Hitler's terms and informed Chancellor Schuschnigg that he could proceed in his deal with the Germans. Another empty threat. Another concession. The next day, Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg phoned Berlin to officially notify the German government that the Austrians would comply with Hitler's terms. It worked. Minister Goebbels wrote about it in his diary again. The effect is quick and strong. In Austria, the impression is created that Germany is taking serious military actions. But Schuschnigg still had an ace up his sleeve. 
the only man in Europe that was more infamous and more feared than Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini. Benito Mussolini, the Duce himself. The son of an Italian blacksmith socialist, Mussolini was a professor, a journalist. He was a mason in Geneva and an editor of a newspaper in Milan. He studied the works of Nietzsche, Marx, and Garibaldi. He was a soldier in the Great War and promoted to corporal for his loyalty. He was against the war, then for the war. He was the leading socialist in the country, then expelled from his political party for extremism. He fought nine months in the trenches and was wounded when a mortar exploded in his lines. It left 40 pieces of shrapnel in his body. He talked about that a lot. Shortly after the war, he started a political revolution in his home country of Italy. He built an ideology of fascism and traditionalism combined. He galvanized a struggling post-war country into a frenzy over Italy's deserved growth, invoking the days of the Roman Empire and its vast sphere of influence. That's when his political revolution became a real one. He recruited a private army called the Black Shirts. They started riots and violent protests in the streets. The Italian government didn't interfere because the Black Shirts were fighting against the communists, who were the real threat. And if you're starting to think that all of this sounds very familiar, wait till you hear this. On the night of October 27th, 1922, almost exactly one year before the young Hitler's beer hall coup, Benito Mussolini led 30,000 black shirts in a march on Rome, demanding that the prime minister resign and form a new fascist government. The king of Italy offered no support to the prime minister, and he was forced to step down. On that day, at age 39, Benito Mussolini was appointed as the youngest prime minister in the country's history. They called him Il Duce, the leader. If you had asked anyone in the mid-1930s who the biggest threat in Europe was, they would not have said Hitler. They would have said Mussolini. This might seem obvious now, but Hitler idolized Mussolini. It was no coincidence that the nervous young Hitler's coup attempt in that Bavarian beer hall was an identical copy of Mussolini's march on Rome that had taken place a year before. Hitler would talk about Mussolini with reverence and respect, here was a man, he would say, who loved his country and the rule of law. Mussolini also subscribed to the same pseudoscientific, racist ideologies as the Nazis. Hitler admired him. In the years that followed Mussolini's rise to power, he had shocked the world by ordering the Italian army to invade Ethiopia, to begin his so-called revival of the Roman Empire. But Africa wasn't the only region Mussolini had his eye on. He was also looking north into Austria. He declared that Italy would be a military ally and protector of Austria. Under the terms of their treaty, if Austria were ever attacked, Italy would be required to come to its defense. And now, in 1938, Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg, knowing that the threat of attack was more real than ever before, wrote an urgent letter to the Duce on the same day he sent his response to Hitler telling Mussolini about the meeting with the German leader in the Alps and asked him to reconfirm Italy's commitment to Austria as a protector. Schuschnigg was relieved when he got an immediate reply from Mussolini that their relationship had not changed. Italy and Austria were still protector and protectorate, and the Italian dictator said that he would provide military support if Austria were ever invaded. On the morning of February 16th, Schuschnigg began to carry out his devil's bargain. He announced to the people of Austria that the ban on the Nazi party would be lifted, and that several Nazi prisoners would be pardoned and released. He also announced that he would be forming a new cabinet. On this cabinet would be a new minister of security, a young Austrian Nazi sympathizer named Zeiss Ingwart. 
Ingvart was hand-picked by Hitler, and the German leader had big plans for the young Austrian. After he was appointed, Ingvart was summoned to Berlin for his orders. Four days later, Hitler announced to the public what his plan would be. He made a speech to the Reichstag on the subject of Austria. At first, he praised Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg for his recognition of the will of the Austrian people. But as we know, Hitler believed that Austrians and many Czechoslovakians were really Germans, with a shared heritage, a shared language, a shared history. The second part of his speech made it clear what his true desires were. Over 10 million Germans live in two of the states adjoining our frontiers. It is unbearable for a world power to know that there are racial comrades at its side, but are constantly being inflicted with the severest suffering and their sympathy and unity of the whole nation, which is its destiny. To the interests of the German Reich belong the protection of those German peoples. Translation. We're going to make the so-called Germans living in Austria and Czechoslovakia our business. As part of this speech, Germany used their new Austrian influence to organize pro-Nazi protests all around Austria. And with the newly appointed Nazi, Ingwart, in charge of Austrian security, no action was taken to stop these demonstrations, even after they got violent. The Austrian Chancellor fired back with a defiant speech of his own, claiming that We Austrians have gone very far, but will go no further. Austria will never voluntarily give up its independence. He closed his speech with an old Austrian war cry, summoning the colors of the Austrian flag. Red, white, red, until we're dead. But by the end of February, the Austrian Chancellor's government was starting to fall apart. International business was pulling out of Austria. Large withdrawals were being made from Austrian banks. Tourism grinded to a halt due to fear of political developments. Schuschnigg became desperate. He reached out to all of his old political enemies, including the socialists, who only a few years ago tried to revolt against the Austrian government, and begged them to counter-protest in response to the Nazi protests. In the first week of March, in his last Hail Mary move to show the world that Austrians wanted to keep their independence, Schuschnigg pulled a gutsy move. He declared that a national referendum, a popular vote, was to be held on the question of Austrian independence in just four days. He knew that without time for the Nazi propaganda machine to organize a campaign, the Austrian people would vote to maintain their independence. The next morning, on March 6th in Berlin, upon hearing of the Austrian referendum, that he had been politically outmaneuvered by Schuschnigg, Hitler became enraged. He erupted in his office and scrambled his staff. He immediately called for all of his generals to convene at the capital. At 10 a.m., Hitler called for the head of his military high command, General Keitel, to prepare Operation Otto. Operation Otto was a military plan that Hitler asked to be developed for this moment, an invasion of Austria. Now, not all military operations that had been drummed up by Hitler were developed completely. Most of them worked like concept cars. The basics all worked in theory, but no real operational planning had been done yet. Remember, Hitler's entire military was only four years old, so after receiving his orders to prepare Operation Otto, General Keitel was certain it wasn't finished yet, and so they would now have to do a significant amount of work to make it ready for action. General Keitel rushed to High Command Headquarters and asked his Chief of Staff, How much of Operation Auto has been developed? The Chief of Staff looked at him, flabbergasted. Nothing has been prepared for Operation Auto. Nothing at all. Keitel raced back to the Reich Chancellery, where his orders were formalized by Hitler. Keitel didn't dare tell Hitler that no such operation had been prepared, only expressed concern that it would be extremely difficult to execute such a large-scale action on such short notice. He then sped back to high command to oversee the drafting of the operation. There, over the course of only five hours, they developed a plan for the German army to invade Austria. 
by 6 p.m., the hastily written orders had been completed, or as completed as they could be in a day's work, and General Keitel had dispatched them to the Army and the Air Force. The preparations for the invasion had begun. There was only one more obstacle in front of Hitler before he could invade with impunity. His own idol, the only leader in Europe that Hitler had respect for, the Duce, Benito Mussolini. Hitler was very worried about what Mussolini might do. Remember, according to Italy's treaty with Austria, Italy would protect Austria if they were ever invaded. To test the waters on this, Hitler asked one of his senior diplomats to take a secret plane to Rome and hand-deliver a letter to the Duce from Hitler, explaining an action that Hitler was contemplating and asked for the Duce's understanding. In the letter, Hitler made up an elaborate story about how Austria was on the brink of chaos and that they were planning to restore their old monarchy. Hitler even said that Austria was about to attack Germany. He also said that Chancellor Schuschnigg had just announced a sham referendum in order to justify all of this madness. Then, Hitler explains what he's about to do. I want you to listen to the tone of Adolf Hitler in his letter to Mussolini. Take note of just how reverent and groveling he is. I now may solemnly wish to assure your excellency, as the Duce of Italy, that I consider this only as a step of national self-defense. You too, your excellency, would not act any differently if the fate of Italians were at stake. In this critical hour for Italy, I prove to you our steadfast sympathies. Do not doubt that in the future there will be no change in this respect. Whatever the consequences of the coming events may be, I have drawn a definitive boundary between Germany and France and will now do just the same between Italy and us. Always, in friendship, yours, Adolf Hitler. The German diplomat flew the letter to Rome and delivered it to Mussolini. Hitler anxiously awaited his reply. After some time, Hitler received a phone call. It was his diplomat calling from Rome. He had received Mussolini's answer. Hitler picked up the phone and heard the voice of his diplomat. I have just come from the Palazzo Venezia. The Duce accepted the whole thing with a very friendly manner. He sends you his regards. Mussolini said that Austria would be immaterial to him. Immaterial. Unimportant. Unprotected abandoned. Hitler couldn't believe his luck. His hero, his idol, just selected Germany over Austria. Hitler's voice began to shake as he spoke over the phone back to his diplomat. Then please tell Mussolini that I will never forget him for this. Yes. Never, never, never. Whatever happens, I am still ready to make quite a different agreement with him. Yes, I told him that too. As soon as the Austrian affair is settled, I will be ready to go with him through thick and thin, no matter what. Yes, my chief. Listen, I will make any agreement. I am no longer in fear of the terrible position that would have existed between us if we had gotten into a conflict. You may tell him that I thank him ever so much. Never, never will I forget that. Yes, my chief. I will never forget it. Whatever happens, if he should ever need any help or be in any danger, he can be convinced that I will stick with him whatever might happen, even if the whole world were against him. Yes, my chief. You can almost see Hitler jumping up and down in his office. It was the green light. The invasion could commence. The final orders from Hitler for Operation Otto were dispatched to his generals. This is what they read. Top secret. One. If other measures prove unsuccessful, I intend to invade Austria with armed forces to establish constitutional conditions and to prevent further abuse of the pro-German population. Two. The whole operation will be directed by me. 3. The force of the army and the air force detailed for this operation must be ready for invasion on March 12, 1938, at the latest by 12 o'clock. 4. The behavior of the troops must be given the impression that we do not want to wage war against our Austrian brothers. Therefore, any provocation is to be avoided. If, however, resistance is offered, it must be broken ruthlessly by force of arms. And after receiving Mussolini's reply, Hitler added two additional orders. 5. If Czechoslovakian soldiers or militia are to be encountered, they are to be treated as hostile. 
six. Italians everywhere are to be treated as friends. On this night of March 10th and into the morning of March 11th, as all of these orders were flying around Germany to commanders, military bases, and airfields, the Chancellor of Austria was in his bed in Vienna, struggling to sleep. Until the phone rang. Herr Chancellor, I have urgent news. The Germans have closed the border at Salzburg. Rail traffic between the two countries has been halted, and German troops are concentrating on the Austrian frontier. The Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg sped off to the Chancellery. On the way, he stopped at a church, where the first mass was being read. He sat in the back, in a pew, wrestling with what to do. He didn't come up with any good answers. He made the sign of the cross and left for the chancellery. When he arrived, almost no one was there. No news had come from his ambassadors abroad, so he ordered the police to make a line around the city and called his cabinet to convene for an emergency meeting. Within an hour, Shushnig's cabinet members were assembled at the chancellery to prepare for the worst. As the meeting was getting underway, a message from Berlin arrived to the group. It was read out loud to the room. It was a communication from the German government that they were to immediately call off the referendum on Austrian independence. And a special note was added that Hitler was furious. The cabinet heatedly debated the issue of the referendum for hours. In the end, Schuschnigg relented and agreed to call off the referendum. Hitler's show of aggression proved to Schuschnigg that the symbolic victory he might gain would come at the cost of spilling Austrian blood. In his mind, it was not worth it. Remember Zeiss Ingwart, the young, Nazi-friendly Austrian minister of security that was handpicked by Hitler? He was present in the cabinet meeting while all of this discussion was going on, listening, even participating in the meeting. Once it was over, he went back to his office and picked up the phone. He was calling Berlin. What happened over the next seven hours would alter the course of history. It would change the makeup of Europe and forge Hitler's place on the world stage once and for all. It would also decide if Hitler was a man of empty threats or a man of brutal conquest. All in the next seven hours. And nearly all of it has been recorded, word for word. What you are about to hear are actual transcripts found in the records of Hermann Göring's office, years later. They have been translated from German to English, and took place over 27 phone calls made between Austria and Germany on March 11, 1938, from 2.45 p.m. to 9 p.m. Are you listening closely? It's 2.45 p.m. in Vienna. The Austrian Nazi sympathizer Zeiss Inkwart just got out of his meeting with Chancellor Schuschnigg. He picked up the phone and called Berlin. The office of the rotund Hermann Göring, second in command of the Third Reich. Göring answered the phone on the other line. He knew the call was coming. How do you do, Herr Doctor? My brother-in-law, is he with you? No. How are things with you? Do you have any news? The Chancellor cancelled elections for Sunday, and precautionary measures are being ordered, among others, a curfew. Well, that's not enough anymore. That'll only postpone it. The Chancellor has broken the Berghoff Agreement. I'll speak to the Fuhrer and call you back. Zeiss Inkwart, the Nazi spy inside of the Austrian government, just told Göring about what had happened in the cabinet meeting, that the referendum on Austrian independence had been called off. Goring, speaking for Hitler, said it was already too late. Inkvart returned to the meeting. Twenty minutes later, the phone rings. It's Berlin. It's for Inkvart. He excuses himself and steps out of the room to answer the phone. It's Goring. He spoke to Hitler. 
Ingvar picks up the receiver, but doesn't even have time to get a word in before Göring is shouting Hitler's response. Berlin does not support the decision made by Chancellor Schuschnigg. He does not have the confidence of our government because he broke the Berghoff Agreement. So we have no reason to have confidence in his future actions either. Therefore, he must immediately resign and be replaced by you, Ingvart. We need confirmation within two hours. If I don't hear back from you within one hour, I'll assume it has been done. Hitler could tell that his fear tactics were working, and pushed it further. Now, it was no longer enough to have a hand-picked Austrian cabinet. Now, Chancellor Schuschnigg must resign, and be replaced by the Nazi puppet, Ingvart. Nearly an hour passes. It's now 3.55 p.m. The next phone call is Ingvart phoning Berlin, as instructed to update Göring. Ingvart speaks first. Field Marshal, Chancellor Schuschnigg is on his way to President Miklas to hand in his resignation, and the resignation of his cabinet. What about you as Chancellor? Is that secure? I will tell you no later than 5.30 p.m. Listen to me. Along with Schuschnigg's resignation, you as his successor is an absolute firm demand. In just over an hour, by the will of Adolf Hitler in Germany, the Chancellor of Austria had agreed to resign. He was now on his way to President Miklas to hand in his resignation. The next step was to confirm that the Nazi, Inkwart, would be Schuschnigg's successor and the new Chancellor of Austria. But remember, Austrian chancellors can't make that decision on their own. In order to make Inkwart the new Chancellor, President Miklas had to agree to appoint him. Another hour would pass before the next phone call. This time, it wasn't Ingvart himself calling Berlin to give an update to Göring. It was one of Ingvart's aides, a young officer. He was nervous on the phone with the second most powerful Nazi in the world. His voice was shaking. I have to report the following. Zeiss Ingvart was speaking to the Austrian Chancellor until 4.30, but can't dissolve the cabinet by 5.30 because it's not technically possible. Goring roared back. Well, by 7.30, the new cabinet needs to be formed, and a lot of other things need to happen. Is Zeiss Ingvart there? He is not. He's in the meeting. That's why he sent me here to call you. What is the message? Repeat it exactly. The message what is that... What does he have to say? He says that we can bring in the party organization now. I don't care about that. I want to know what's going on. Did Ingvar tell you that he is now the Chancellor? Y y yes That's what he said to you? Y yes. Good. Now go on. What time can he form the new cabinet? Maybe after nine o'clock. No, the cabinet must be formed by 7:30. By 7:30. We're sending Kepler to help with this. Okay. To continue. The SA and the SS have already been organized by our police. Okay, the SA and SS have been organized. You must also demand that the Nazi party be legalized. All right. In all of its forms, too. The SA, the SS, everything. Okay, so the German forces are not coming into Austria now? They'll be there in the next few days. Oh, after the referendum. Wait, no, no, what referendum? A referendum that will be organized by Hitler. Oh, well... Things need to be worked out with that. But the referendum that was scheduled for tomorrow must be cancelled. Yes, that's been taken care of. It's already out of the question. Good. And the cabinet must be entirely Nazi. Yes, that's also been taken care of. By 7.30 it will be... It has to be reported to us by 7.30. Kepler is bringing you the list of the names for the cabinet. And the party has definitely been legalized? Yes, we don't even need to talk about that. In all of its organizations? In all of its organizations in Austria, yes. In uniform? In uniform. Good. Yes, the SA and the SS have already been on patrol for the past half hour, so everything is good there. And by 7.30 we need the report of the new cabinet. You will have it by then. Be careful. The press must be immediately removed and replaced by our people. Confusion. Tension. But it seemed to Goring like progress was being made. According to the young aide who spoke to Goring, Ingvart had now been appointed Chancellor to replace Schuschnigg. The SA and the SS had been organized in Austria, and it seemed like they were on track to form a new cabinet this evening, and pave the way for the German operation to move into the country. 
without firing a shot. But 20 minutes later, at 5.26 p.m., Goring received another call from Austria. This time, it was from Inkvart himself, freshly out of his meeting with the president of Austria. As it turned out, things were not what they seemed. Inkvart began his update to Goring. Here's the situation. The president has accepted the chancellor's resignation, but he'd like to... He'd like to appoint another man as chancellor. We have people talking to him now and to report any changes. What? Wait a minute. Look here. This changes everything. This is entirely different from what I was just told. The aide I just spoke to said that you had been given the chancellorship. That I had been given the chancellorship? When did he say that? Just an hour ago. He said that the chancellor and the party had been restored. That the SA and the SS had already taken over the police and all that. What? No, that hasn't happened yet. I just told the president to give the chancellorship to me, and that usually takes three hours at a minimum. As for the party, we haven't physically restored the party yet. We just ordered the SA and the SS to take over the police. Well, that won't do. Under no circumstances. The situation is already moving. The president needs to be immediately informed that he must turn over the powers of the Austrian chancellor to you and accept the cabinet like it was arranged. You as chancellor and everything- Field Marshal, one of my aides just walked in and just met with President Miklas. May he report an update to you? Yes, go ahead. Another voice is heard on the line now. Field Marshal, the situation is that President Miklas still refuses to give his consent for official diplomatic action from Germany. Myself and the other three party members went in to speak with him directly to make him aware of the hopeless situation and convince him to say yes, but he wouldn't even let us see him. All this time, he's not willing to give in. Give me Inkvart. Inkvart's voice is back. Field Marshal? Now, listen to me carefully. As soon as you hang up this phone, you will go see President Miklas and tell him that if our conditions are not accepted immediately, the entire line of troops that are already stationed on the border will march in tonight, and Austria will cease to exist. Tell him that this is not a joke, that the invasion will begin tonight from all corners of Austria. We will stop the troops and hold them at the border only if we are informed by 7.30 that the president has appointed you as chancellor. Then you should call on all of the Nazis all over the country. They should now be in the streets. If the president could not understand it in four hours, we will make him understand it now in four minutes. It's now 7.30 p.m. Schuschnigg has been forced to step down as chancellor. Germany is about to invade, and Austria is in perhaps its final hours of existence. The now ex-Chancellor Schuschnigg was sitting by himself. All was lost. Then, he did something. He decided that he would not go quietly. He would take one more act of courage, of defiance. He went to the radio office and told the operator, who was not yet aware of his resignation, to interrupt all radio channels in the country with an emergency broadcast. He would tell the world what had happened, in hopes that someone might come to their aid, or at least ensure the truth got out if they were indeed at the end. All across Austria, every radio cut to silence. Every home, every living room, every kitchen, the music or the news that was playing gave way to quiet. Then, after a few moments, the Austrian people heard the voice of their chancellor one last time. Good evening. This day has placed us in a tragic and decisive situation. I have to give my Austrian fellow countrymen the details of the events of today. The German government today handed to President Miklas an ultimatum with a time limit, ordering him to nominate as chancellor a person picked by the German government, 
and to appoint members of a cabinet picked by the German government. Otherwise, German troops would invade Austria. I declare before the world that reports launched in Germany concerning disorders by the workers, the shedding of blood, and a situation beyond the control of the Austrian government are lies from A to Z. President Miklas has asked me to tell the people of Austria that we have yielded to force, since we are not prepared, even in this terrible situation, to shed blood. We have decided to order the troops to offer no resistance. So, I now take leave of the Austrian people, with the German word of farewell uttered from the depths of my heart. Alvita Zayn, God protect Austria. It's 7.57 p.m., 27 minutes after Schuschnigg's radio broadcast. Zeisingfart called Berlin to give Goring another update. Field Marshal, Schuschnigg has made an emergency broadcast over the radio that the German government is giving Austria an ultimatum. I heard it. He said that the government itself is abdicated. The Austrian military will not put up a defense. They are awaiting the invasion. The Austrian government is doing this on their own. And they still refuse to make you Chancellor. Yes, like before, President Miklos refused. They know they are taking a chance. Okay, I will give the order to march in. You make sure that as this happens, you take control of power. And give this message to every official and staffer. Anyone who attempts to organize resistance will be court-martialed by our invading troops. That includes anyone, no matter how senior, even President Miklos himself. Is that clear? Yes, they won't resist. They're given an order not to resist. Austrian orders are irrelevant to me, Ingvart. President Miklas hasn't appointed you as Chancellor. That can also be considered resistance. Yes, Field Marshal. Well, you are now officially appointed as Chancellor. Yes, Field Marshal. Good luck, Herr Hitler. Fifteen minutes later, Göring makes a call from Berlin to try to reach Ingvart again. Ingvart was now working to assume power and could not answer the phone. One of his aides did instead. Göring was making him aware that the invasion was about to begin, and give his final instructions. Tell Ingvart the following. As we understand it, the government has abdicated, but he himself remained. So, he should continue to stay in office and carry out necessary measures in the name of the government. The invasion is going to happen now, and we shall state that everyone who puts up a resistance will face the consequences. But Austrians may join us at any time. I would like to avoid chaos. Ingvart will make it happen. He's already making the speech. Okay, but he should take over the government now and carry things out quietly. It would be best if Miklas resigns. Yes, but he won't. It was very dramatic. I spoke to him for 15 minutes. He declared that he will, under no circumstances, yield to force. What does he mean? That he he just wants to be kicked out? Yes, he doesn't want to move. Well, with a man of 14 children, you can't move as much as you'd like. All right, tell Ingvar to take over, then. While all of this was going on, Goring had sent one of his own senior officers, a man named Kepler, to Vienna to help with the situation. Thirty minutes after Göring had ordered the invasion, at 8.48, Kepler phoned Berlin to update Göring on the status of the takeover. I want to give you a quick update. President Miklas has refused to do anything, but nevertheless, the Austrian government has ceased to function. I spoke to Schuschnigg, and he said that they had laid down their functions and acted accordingly. 
Inkvart gave a speech over the radio. I heard about it. Continue. The old Austrian government ordered the army not to put up any resistance. Therefore, shooting is not allowed. Okay, I don't give a damn. Soon, there will be another speech over the radio. And we now have a request from a prominent British broadcaster in Berlin who wants a statement for the Austrian people. Well, I don't know about that yet. Listen, the main thing is this, that Inkvart takes over all powers of the government, that he keeps the radio stations occupied. Field Marshal, we are the government now. Factor four in how to start a war is fear. At several stages of negotiations between Hitler and Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg, Hitler bluffed and played up his aggression towards Austria, knowing that it would strike fear into the heart of the Austrian Chancellor. From the demands he made in the Berghof meeting in the Alps, to angrily calling his general when Schuschnigg couldn't guarantee Hitler's demands immediately, to scrambling his military, to threats of invasion. At the time these threats were made, none of them had the actual intention of being carried out. They were productions of terrorism, charades capitalizing on fear. In the days that followed the fall of Austria, the Nazis released a fake telegram that supposedly originated from the Austrian government which formally requested the assistance of German troops to enter Austria to help them re-establish peace and order. It's hard not to think about what might have happened if Schuschnigg had stood his ground. Perhaps the international community might have noticed Hitler's hostility out in the open. Or perhaps it would have just led to countless dead. Instead, Hitler's story about the telegraph from Vienna would become the conventional wisdom, that Austria had requested the assistance of the German military. No allied democracy, not France, not Great Britain, not the United States, would act. Instead, they would once again make only verbal and symbolic statements of disapproval. Hitler's plan worked. The annexation of Austria, or Anschluss as it would be called in Europe, was a triumph for Hitler. Five days after German troops crossed the border of Austria, on the 15th of March, the triumphant Hitler would return to the city of his youth and his home country. The streets in which he walked, as a vagabond house painter, as a drifter wearing dirty clothes, now were lined with his troops and hundreds of thousands of adoring onlookers throwing flowers, shouting his name. After Austria, Hitler's popularity would reach new heights in Germany, completing a long-standing goal of unification. Within a week of the annexation, Heinrich Himmler, the former chicken farmer, who now oversaw the SS Gestapo, performed over 70,000 arrests in Austria. Over the next several months, the Nuremberg Laws would be applied to Austria as well. Thousands of Jewish people would be arrested. All synagogues in the capital city would be destroyed. Jewish businesses would be raided and shut down. All over the city, Jews would be forced to clean the anti-Nazi graffiti that had been sprayed onto the streets during the riots. Over 130,000 Jews would flee the country. Almost all who stayed would become victims of the Holocaust. Historians estimate that out of the 65,000 Jews in Vienna that were captured and sent to concentration camps, only 2,000 would survive the end of the war. Austria was the first free nation to fall. It would not be the last. 
It was, to Hitler, making official what was already true in his mind. A German region full of Germans are now part of a great German state. There was only one remaining country that fit this description left in Europe. And Hitler was determined to finish the job. Next time on How to Start a War. How to Start a War is written and produced by me. I'm Michael Trapani. Thanks for listening.